April Fool's Day, 1940, Faulkner publishes the Hamlet and we enter into his comic masterpieces. When you look at a lot of his writings, a lot of people spend their time in The Sound and the Fury through Absalom, Absalom, As I Lay Dying. Why do we spend all this time on his tragedies? We forget that Faulkner has amazing comedies that are just fun and enjoyable to read. And that's how I introduce my friend here, Mr. Crypto, to William Faulkner. Oh, the reverse is so good, so funny. But this one is also a very funny story as well. Is that true? Is he really released this on April Fool's? No, it's true. It really did come out April 1st, 1940. And it's interesting because the Snopes just doesn't receive as much attention. As I said, like all of his comedies seem to be on the lower end when it comes to studying. And even at the time of us kicking off the summer of Snopes, as we're going through the entire Snopes trilogy, there's not a single video on YouTube or podcasts, on Apple Podcasts at least, that I could search, that actually focuses on the Hamlet by William Faulkner. Is Faulkner typecasted sort of as a specific writer? Maybe. you just He is this, and that's what he's known for, and this is what you're going to enjoy most about him, and that's why they focus heavily on the, quote, tragedies. You know, I think it's authors usually have like this fierce period where they create their best work. Right. Like their best work seems to be around these two or three, four or five releases. You know, nobody has had as many hits as William Faulkner has, it seems like, at least at that point in time. But um, after that, I think he changed his style. It's like, you know, when a band changes like their music or their genre a little bit, you know, flipping from all of these dark depths of humanity's past about how America became the way it was with its mistreatment and the class commentary and the racial commentary to make things more readable, to make it more poppy, fun, um, especially after his Hollywood days of chasing money that uh, I think it might maybe have hit people at the time as him being a different band than what they had originally signed up for. So you're telling me that this is his ice, ice baby? <laughs> <laughs> so how did all of this get started? We actually start out in the early days of Faulkner's mind with the Snopes in 1926, uh, Father Abraham. Right, where it references them and even talks about them being this rapacious group that moves from town to town and just absorbs and steals all the local resources like locusts, if you will. And he continues to write these short stories and actually from Flags in the Dust all the way up through Sanctuary, like every single novel mentions a Snope at some point in time. Like if you remember Sanctuary, remember it was the politician on the train. Yeah, you said many times, you're like, oh, well, this will make more sense when we read the Snopes trilogy. Oh, this will make more sense when we, we read Hamlet. Oh, this will make more sense when we read The Town. You've said that so many times to me as we've read all these different Faulkner novels. Well, if you think about it, remember, he specifically extorted someone and won money out of the exchange of information and such. And that's kind of a big thing with the Snopes is this idea of, I feel like, you know, it's 1940 when this finally comes out. Uh, he, he even wrote a letter to Robert Haas in 1938 that said that he had this vision for what the Snopes trilogy was going to be and, and went through several iterations of names and stuff like that. But you can see he took short stories, right? Like the opening of this is like almost ejecting out of the short story barn burning. And then we go into Fool About a Horse and, and then everybody's favorite spotted horses for that final scene <laughs> in, in Peasants, you know. It's it's interesting the way he takes these stories and he knew kind of, I think, what he wanted to explore, but still reimagine, change the narrators of some of the stories and stitch them together. And this kind of became how he wrote a lot of these novels. Like this is how Go Down Moses was written. This is how On a Vanquish was written. He takes these short stories coming out of, uh, you know, his really time-focused time in... Um, Hollywood and starts to create these narratives that I, I think are, are still very enjoyable, even if they aren't the same narrative force that the tragedies bring to the table. Agreed. As a novice Faulkner reader, I feel like, yes, that there may be some, you know, convoluted theories here about, you know, him, him planning all this out. But I can see that this definitely feels more planned out than a lot of other trilogies of series and movies and things that I've watched and read over the years. It definitely feels cohesive so far through the first book. I'm really excited to get into the town next and see kind of where the Snopes gang goes. So what time does this story take place? I asked this question in the Voxer group where we're celebrating this as a part of Faulkner in August, reading all three of the Snopes trilogy leading up to our traditional every year annual Faulkner read. And there was an interesting point of someone said like, well, OK, well, it's around this time because of this, the St. Louis St. Fair. And they made a reference to that. I'm like, oh, OK, cool, cool. Got it. 
And then they made some references to the, you know, oh, this is 30 years after the Civil War. And I'm like, wait, that that's like a decade before that that fair. And then when you get into like the last part, they talk about um, Wall Street. He was named a couple years after that Wall Street panic, which was, I think, the panic of 1907. So we are all over the place. And it's actually interesting. Someone in the Voxer group posted a link that says, yeah, I don't think Faulkner knew what time it was. He definitely moved around. <laughs> now, whether you view that as a mistake or do you take a very um, critic approach to it where you're like, oh, OK, Faulkner doesn't care about time. He's trying to make this like this purgatory of space of how the the people in the lineage is more important than a narrative story in time. We'll leave that up to you. But, you know, it's somewhere around that turn of the century time. <laughs> well, we've already talked about that Faulkner is maybe not necessarily planning this all out perfectly, but. If you look at the timeline through just this first novel itself, it is kind of changing perspective from different narrators, and that's going to be, you know, people's point of views, and then it is jumping throughout time as well. So I think to nail it down as a, to a specific year is, is not going to help you enjoy or analyze the book any better anyway. No, I agree. If, if you're going to spend time in purgatory, you know you're going to pay the devil. Why worry about what time it is, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> Time's infinite, so does it really matter? So the story starts off in Frenchman's Ben. And in traditional Faulkner, we start wide. Like the creation of the land, this unnamed Frenchman that is named in other pieces. But uh, it, it comes together and then and then zooms in, right? And and now we're fo- like honing in on Will Varner, who owns the land. Right. And in some biographies that I've read, it kind of helps explain a little bit some of these minor comments about around this time in the U.S., these small uh, shop owners. Well, that's that was everything. That's not only where you got supplies, but that was a lot of times your bank loan, too, because around this time, post reconstruction, like the the liens were just absurd. So people would borrow money from people like Will Varner for a little piece of the land, for a little piece of the cow, for a little uh, piece of that crop output. And they actually became the richest men in town. And that's exactly what Faulkner's kind of painting here with Will Will Varner that may not have been apparent. Uh, You know, while he does get the white steed and he is the one that has the throne of flower that he sits upon, uh, there's actually a very deeply rooted American history to that. These guys aren't necessarily multimillionaire monopoly owners like Vanderbilt or Carnegie or any of, you know, the, the great Rockefeller, but they are the monopoly giants for their small towns. They own the general store. They own the bar. They own, you know, the brothel. They own pieces of farms. They're the go-to guy for loans. And sometimes they're not loaning out money necessarily. They're loaning out seeds or farm equipment, but they, they're the go-to one-stop shop. Uh, uh, they're, they're Amazon of the time period. So yeah, of course, <laughs> they're, they're going to make a killing, uh, you know, in having so many you know hands in different pies. You know, and the people come to the town, it talks about how they left their China hutches behind, didn't come with anyone. One person came with an African-American. So you can kind of see that they they really come here with nothing. You know, a lot of them are sharecroppers, uh, people that are coming from poor white class backgrounds that are trying to make a way in the world. And I think that's kind of one of the main things that I really explored with this round is that exploration of class and money. Uh, it's something that I didn't quite get on my first read through. But more importantly is, man, that intro of Ab Snopes, like he walks in like it's a spaghetti western, like, <laughs> do 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 wow, wow, wow. <laughs> yeah, it does have that, uh, you know, very dramatic entrance. You know, he's throwing up the, the bar saloon door and, you know, what do you got to drink in here? And whiskey or whiskey? <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> he's definitely a man's man. And you have the locals that are all like, oh, that's the man that fire follows. Like he's he's comes to town in the same way that the town has a past that follows the town and gives meaning to a lot of the things there. So does Ab Snopes, like, like he comes to town with this past, this, this fire following him. And you see the towns kind of spread members, spreading the rumors and such. And it's interesting because like, this is a town where they specifically call out at the end of this first section that nobody tended the store. People knew how much things were. They left the exact amount and there was no need. But uh uh-oh, here comes danger with Ab Snopes. Fire follows him. We need someone to watch the store. And just like, you know, the, the infestation of rats and how they always compare the Snopes to snakes and falcons and, and predatory animals, in comes his son, right? Like, 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 it's almost like that nepotism. 
of the Snopes look out for Snopes and they, they just spread across the land and consume the resources. And now we need someone to watch the store now that Ab Snopes is in town. You'd mentioned earlier about this felt like purgatory and there's obviously a lot of religious stuff in here as well. I thought it was very interesting that Faulkner named him Abner and not Abraham because I every time I see it, I think Abe and not Ab. Uh, that short, I keep thinking, oh yeah, his name's not Abraham because I thought he was going to give him like that biblical name and he was have kind of maybe some a redemption story. But no, this is just uh, this is a nasty dude. <laughs> yeah, and I think this really lays the groundwork to explore how are how is Ab and his family going to change the town. Right, because we really get to know Ratliff through this story. He he's kind of a main character for us to explore the Snopes' influence on the Hamlet, right? The Frenchman's Ben. And it, it to me, Ratliff, he's he only sells three. <laughs> they call him a sewing machine salesman, but he they said he only sells three a year. But he's really moving, you know, vegetables and and little wares. Like he's kind of like a barter system, knows town locals. But he's a good guy, right? Like he's friends with people. He knows how to make a good deal, but he still isn't taking advantage of them. He's working within capitalism, though. And along comes the Snopes. Snopesism. <laughs> and Indeed. and Flem is a capitalist through and through, but he's not afraid to take advantage of others, to abuse the systems, to fool others into worse deals. He's the snake salesman that comes in and takes advantage of capitalism because capitalism is a system without morality. And we as human beings a lot of time apply right and wrong, good and evil on top of what is ultimately a transactional system. And then here comes Mr. Flem Snopes, who doesn't follow those morals. He's kind of amoral with how he makes decisions, and that's going to greatly change the DNA of this town that used to have that store unarmed. This is one of the other things I thought was kind of a major theme of moving forward in time, and that the South was playing catch up with the North during this time period because they'd have been stuck in their old way of thoughts and the farming and not, I mean, capitalism kind of went along with the revolutions of technology, right? You don't really need to rely heavily, heavily on capitalism in a agricultural based society where here Flem's coming in and saying, hey, in other parts of the country, you know, it, it, it's a dog eat dog world. And this is the American dream of to pull yourself up by the bootstraps and persevere and push forward and make the most that you can for yourself. And I, I feel like he is pushing the town forward into that new mindset of the 20, early, early, early 20th century, Getting depending on when you think this story is taking place. And I love that. I, I wouldn't say that he's evil. I love that idea that he's amoral uh, because he's just using capitalism to the best of his ability, which all Americans should be doing according to the American dream, which is kind of taking its root hold in our cultural identity at this time period. Yeah, I really like that point because he's if he is representing that American ideal, pull yourself up by the bootstraps when there ain't no boots because he's part of the poor class, he's challenging the aristocracy, the people that have the land and have passed down wealth. Like it's almost like to your point about the rigid, rigid South uh, class system, they were expecting these hand-me-downs. They were expecting who you marry matters. And now here comes Flem Snopes and kind of uproots everything that we thought about class systems. Of course, one of the major themes that we see in a lot of Faulkner works is the the deal gone wrong. And we always have some type of person trying to swindle someone else uh, or get over one person. And don't want to go too much detail about the, the story of this, uh, but the... The horse always comes in somewhere, right? It, it always seems to be about the ponies. And we get the the fool about the horse. And the, the trading of the horses is, I feel like, kind of the 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 crux of the novel, pushing it towards the end of of how these guys are going to get one up on another, uh, you know, to, to swindle them out of their money and become the, the, the powerhouses of, of the town. Well, I agree. And if you look at the structure of the novel— we open with the pawn, the pawn deal going wrong, right? Like you traded something in order to get back. You have to like trade even more than what you originally paid for it. You got screwed over in the deal, right? But, but these horses were things that they owned, right? And if we look at by the end of the novel with Spotted Horses, right, with Flem Snopes, where'd he get them horses from? He stole them from nature, like literally pulling himself like the bootstraps, like you said earlier, and is making something out of nothing, as opposed to the old system, which are trying to barter and trade for things that people already have. So another brilliant little kind of like commentary on how like things are changing for commerce in the United States of America. 
Yeah, I love that part. It was probably my maybe second or third part of the novel where, you know, he's like, oh, these are great ponies. And they go to get them and they just run away <laughs> like, oh, my God. Like you can you can feel like how the, the anger burning through the pages or your e-reader at that part of the novel. It's great. You almost feel like they deserve it, right? Like, you well, I don't know if they deserve it. They, It's almost like they need the lesson to wake up. You know what I mean? Yes. Like, oh, I love that. Ra- yeah. Cause, cause Ratliff, he, why does he enter into this challenge with Flem? He's like, he's like, there's only going to be two people that can fool Flem. One's Will Varner, right? Like our town founder. Like nobody can challenge the aristocracy, right? And the other's yet to be seen when he's talking about himself. So, so it's almost a matter of pride to him to be able to prove that, you know, all oh, this poor, you know, new person in town, he's, he's got to learn how to work his way around. I know these people, right? I know how to work the system. And it's, it's only bit Flem's like double dealings and way of avoiding all of the things that have bogged Ratliff down. It proves to be the lesson that he probably needed to wake up to. Yeah. Well, I mean, he doesn't wait, like when he's tending the store, he doesn't cheat anybody out of anything, but he, he definitely, I feel like this is the first time he uses his prowess to take advantage of someone else uh, because they they do need that awakening. I mean, he is scheming a little bit, but I feel like his are lackluster compared to some of the other parts of the story. Okay, I got it. I got it. I got it. Hear me out. Hear me out. Okay. Do you remember that movie, It's a Wonderful Life? <laughs> yeah, it's very popular. It, it totally romanticizes the idea of, oh, as long as I'm good, I'm friendly, I'm personable, my friends will look out for me, right? And, and I think that's true on some levels. But that Hollywood ending, right, where everyone just pitches in to save the bank and come to his rescue, I think that's Ratliff. Ratliff romanticizes how he's part of this town and how we're all in this together. The way he sits at the storefront getting gossip from all the members of Armstead and, and from Bookwright and all these people, they're all talking about what's going on. Like he's he's one of the boys that that thinks that the town will will come together to rise against challenges. And I don't know if you really see that with with the Snopes. They're kind of consuming the resources and are rather unchallenged as everyone is more self-interested than I think. Uh, Ratliff would like to romanticize. Yeah, old Ratty there. I feel like that he he wants to be part of the Snopes gang. That he wants to be part of their clan, and I think that he is he's he's given them more credit than maybe they deserve, or he's painting them definitely in a positive light. When the rest of the town would would look at that and say, "Oh, you know that that's uh, very skewed or very biased the way that he is portraying them." That's for sure. Yeah. And, and, you know, and then some of the other early shenanigans like the goat trade kind of reminds me of like the car dealership situation that we have today where you have almost kind of like two deals when buying a car. Like if you're not going through, obviously alone, but uh, you, you first negotiate the price of the car, right? And then you have to sometimes, if you don't get an outside loan, you got to negotiate an interest rate with the car dealership, or at least that's how it was when I bought my car last. Right. So it's kind of like the goat dealership is kind of like those two sides of the trade. And it's like the car dealership might make you feel like you're getting a good deal on the car, but then they ream you on the interest (laughs) rates and the loan. Like that's kind of what like Flem's doing is he always comes back with the, Oh, I'm helping you out. I got a good deal for you. But then he comes back with that second deal. Right. And I, I own already like this, this uh, IOU and stuff like that. Like it, it really shows how cunning he is when it comes to using business negotiations. I'll give you a buy one, get one, but I'm going to charge you $10 from both of them or 250 before. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's genius. Mm-hmm. And it, it is capitalism at its best. And you just see it, the growing of how this is going to impact people's relationships, right? Because we haven't talked too much about that, but there's a lot of different workings and relationships going on in this story. And I I think that Flem, he's doing it a little bit selfish, but he is trying to better himself because there is a particular individual that we haven't discussed yet uh, that I think Flem is is, uh, infatuated with like the rest of the town. Eula in chapter two. (laughs) She is... She's, tell you what, she's she's 12 years old when we meet her. Right? So gross. Sorry. And she's just described all physically, right? This woman flesh by her, the size of her breasts, her legs and stuff like that. It's obvious he's he's painting her with a specific intent. You know what I mean? Like Faulkner isn't just going off 
on his own fantasies here. And you'll notice there's a lot of allusions to Greek things in this. We've talked about this before, how Greek mythology always plays an important role with Faulkner. But he, he makes a reference almost immediately to, to Dionysus, who was basically lust, right? Or, or pleasure, if you will, which is what everyone sees in Eula, right? And she's not interested in school. She's slothful, right? If you want to talk about seven deadly sins and such. Uh, and, and she's even kind of like pushed into town by her brother and into these situations. And even like the school teacher falls for her. like And, and he obviously is rejected, Right, like he, she slaps him away. Get away from me! Get your paws off me, old Ichabod Crane. <laughs> <laughs> that was another funny part. That was good. Well, it, you know, here's a really good point that I didn't think about in in this Voxer chat, this Faulkner and August uh, Voxer chat. Brian points out, well, hey, if she wasn't so interested in schooling, why is she making a reference to a literary character like Ichabod Crane? If she is so vapid and empty on the inside, why is she making a decision to say no here? She has agency. There's something behind those curtains that we aren't seeing as an audience or a reader. I think she's playing the version of, quote, like a dumb blonde today or the valley girl. But in actuality, I think that she's very, very smart. She knows how to use her weapons of sexuality to to attack the men in a sense. Uh, I mean, she is the embodiment of female sexuality in this story. Uh, that she is that pure lust. And I love that she kind of uses that against the men. And, you know, she ends up with uh, a husband as a result. Um, and it, it's her power. And I think that Faulkner does a decent job of writing that uh, if you look at those subtle nuances of that she isn't this, you know, clueless, you know, bumpkin that a lot of people are, uh, are, are viewing her as. It's interesting that she starts out at 12 years old. Because that's how old Helen of Troy was when she was taken. It's interesting that in part four, she's even compared to Helen of Troy. And it's even interesting, more interesting, that we have a quote that uh, her long Olympian legs revealed halfway to the thigh astride the wooden horses of merry-go-rounds. And if we go back to Helen of Troy and how they finally stormed the city, he got the Trojan horse for how they infiltrated. Uh, what's what really inside is what matters, <laughs> not the exte <laughs> pretty exterior. It's Faulkner's a genius. He truly is. I, I I can't believe that I hadn't read him before you introduced me. But the 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 sheer layers that he's able to put in there is is just really cool. And I was reading the name wrong the whole time because I kept thinking this was like ooh la la is how I kind of read her name. <laughs> that actually works. It, it, I really like because that. like. She fooled me as a reader, and I think that speaks volumes to how well he's able to write the 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 fool that we become mm. over uh, Eula. I, I love it. G great, <laughs> great writing. Well, and and then to his writing skills, I love how all of her suitors, like you had the white guy with the flannels, who was the first and last Frenchman's Benz ever saw, which is hysterical. But they're just like this collective body that aren't really defined. It's just the suitors were hitting on her. Like, we don't know who it was, but we know how they all wanted her, right? And that kind of leads to McCarran, who, who, interestingly, I love this about Faulkner. He gets this wild backstory. We don't start with him. We start with his daddy <laughs> and how his daddy met his mama <laughs> <laughs> and how they became pregnant. And, you know, just like how the opening of this novel has the secret of Vicksburg money buried in Frenchman's Ben. Well, when his daddy dies, there's that money that gets buried in the chimney and like the secret money. And I think that kind of continues that theme of how Old South aristocracy passed down wealth generation to generation. There's always this lure of how are you going to get the money? How's it going to get given to you? It was never how you earned it, right? And Faulkner just kind of, kind of continually repeats that throughout this whole story. But also, he also gives each character this like, I don't want to say a Homeric simile, like in the Greek myth, but they're given a drawn out backstory. In the same way, Frenchman's Ben has this huge backstory. Before we meet Jody, before we meet Eula, we meet Will Varner. Before we meet Hoke, we meet his daddy and his mama. And the same thing with Flem. Before we met Flem, what was the first Snopes introduced into this story? Uh, Abner. Yep. So to me, this is Faulkner showing how important the past is to the present. This is showing you where we come from matters. And I think that's a big part of American heritage too. And he represents that in the writing without saying a single word, but just by showing and going into detail how important the past is to us now. 
Yeah, you hit the nail on the head there. I think that he he's really, you know, tightening up the story of saying that a lot of times in the South, they weren't looking towards the future. They're always looking to the past of what did my grandparents do? What did daddy do to get me money? Because I'm not looking to work and make my own. I'm looking to find the buried treasure that they they should leave me. And the South is always looking to the past of, you know, what their greatness once was, not what they are. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people talk about how there's not uh, like as much racial commentary, like there's there's racial slurs, but I think there's subtle little hints of Faulkner's past, right? He, he's, he wrote a lot about this in his, you know, great years of tragedy and his great creative sprint. But even here, the way that Hoke grew up with an African-American and uh, he used to, to beat him up, kind of like how uh, during slavery, they, you know, they were abused directly. And then eventually he had to start paying for it. He had to pay for the abuse in a sense. And then ultimately, when uh, he starts getting letters from the suitors and such, he sends the African-American out to do it. And, and he delivers a letter and he's beaten up. They beat up the messenger, which just goes to show you how uh, the, the power comes from the white class here, right? It, it's very subtle. It's very quick. But he always makes sure that that's represented as a part of America's past. And do you think that this is a little bit where we see the knight in shining armor when Flem comes in and he doesn't want Eula for her, her looks and he's going to take her as pregnant that she, you know, uh, she's pregnant with someone else's baby, not his. And again, capitalism matters to him, not love, not beauty, not lust. It's capitalism money because he knows that's where the power is in the future. It's not in land anymore. It's not in slaves. It's in money equals power. And I, 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 Faulkner encapsulates that a hundred plus years ago, and it still hits the nail on the head today in 2022. No, I think you're absolutely right, right? Because LeBeau, what did he offer? Like he, he wanted dominion over her. We, we don't know. He was attracted. It was lust and he got straight out rejected. Right. Yeah. And you had, you had Mr. Flannel pants rejected. You had, <laughs> you had Hoke. Right. And, uh, she, she got pregnant from him, but he, you know, they all, anyone entangled with her, whether it was just lust, whether it was love, they, they split, they took off. And the only one that stuck around to your point was the one that came to the table with money. And he knew that that was going to solidify his moving forwards in the town. And again, I don't think he did it because he's a good guy. I think he did it to have an angle. Well, and I think that I, I think you bring up a really good point because we witness this story through the town, right? Like the way the town's watching the straw suitcase go from place to place. And, and, and Will Varner goes to the bank and comes back. And, and the way that they're buying these things, like the town's watching this, like Faulkner's inviting us to judge these characters. Like, like to your point, he's not the knight in shining armor. We're here to be like, oh, come on. Like you're using this to get land out of Will Varner. Are you kidding me? Like, like we're meant to judge these characters. Oh yeah. If this was a play, you know, that, you know, uh, uh, the, the phlegm would be turning to the audience and going, so I'm going to marry her cause she's lovely. And he'd be giving us a little wink, wink and the audience mm-hmm. would be throwing popcorn. Boo. And she'd be just sitting there still doughy eyed, but she knows what she's doing too, right? I mean, she understands that this is a loveless marriage, but it's something that is going to help give her solidity in in her lifestyle isn't going to have to change too much either. It's like they're, they're coming together knowing that they're using one another. Well, and that's perfect to your point about if this were a play and this were the closing act, you have the hell dream, right? Or, Or vision, whatever it is from Ratliff where he envisions like basically Flem tricking the devil, <laughs> <laughs> like, right? Like this is my second and, favorite part, maybe third favorite part. I don't know. So many and then they're all, and it goes along with all the hellfire and this being purgatory, it, like like the fact that he is the the antithesis to the um. I don't want to say monkey's paw, but the um the Faustian deal, right? He's the one where instead of the devil tricking him. Flem's the one that has the insurance game at the end, the two-handed deal that Flem always wins. And that's just so funny the way that's envisioned for him to be the man that's sitting on the flower throne at the end, right? <laughs> Doesn't this feel like the one part of the novel that's kind of like its own story where the rest of the novel is pretty rational that we talked about economics, a little bit about, you know, class and slavery and men and women and whatnot. But this one totally feels kind of like that irrational you know, dr- mic drop right in the middle of the book by Faulkner. And it's genius too, because it's right at a part that I think needed kind of some hype because we're going to get into 
what maybe some consider kind of the lull of the novel before we reach the climax at the end. Okay, so I'm not alone on that one, thank goodness, because, you know, this is the part <laughs> that they made the, the the movie on, The Long Summer, Long Hot Summer, yeah, whatever it's yeah. called. It so, does have the funniest part with the cow, though, right? Come on. Well, it depends on what part of the cow we're talking about, because <laughs> the chasing the cow... You know, like the way that like even when he's like caressing the cow and describing, I'm like, okay, it's a little creepy, but it's kind of funny. But there's also just really funny Uh. to me. Ike is like the the narration just changes. It's very jarring. If you haven't read Stream of Consciousness in the past, um, it's kind of like a less successful Benji from The Sound and the Fury to me. Yes, that's what I thought. But I was able to successfully navigate it because I'd read Benji. I felt like I was like, oh, I got this. And so I was able to enjoy it more than maybe your traditional reader might. I don't know. So. Yeah. And it's it's got some of the themes I felt like from the other parts, but it definitely felt the most disconnected. Right. Like the way uh, if we're talking about knights in shining armor, Ike kind of views himself as saving this cow. Right, Like when there's the fire and he chases after that cow and Houston eventually finds him and he gives Ike like a coin and then Ike loses it. Right. So Ike is. The, the medical term at, during the time of the writing was idiot, right? Like Faulkner's not just being a jerk, but that was the classification at that point in time. And and he doesn't know how to handle money, well, how to do things. They talked about how he just would flail down the stairs like a fish, which I'm like, I, I think I'm supposed to laugh at that, but it, it's actually kind of cruel. And he's the one that doesn't know how to use money. He's the only one that doesn't understand this commerce. Like he's just trying to save the cow and live with the cow and be happy. He's like, why, why, I don't have to buy it. Like, no, I wasn't returning this to you. Like, he doesn't get this business. And he's given this coin. He doesn't even know what to do with the coin, so he throws it out, like loses it. So it's kind of like he shows how this is a guy that's just completely outside of the rest of the economic system of the rest of the novel, honestly. Yeah, and I guess that's why this part feels a little bit slow is it 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 is time period specific. And it is a little bit uh, jarring, like you said, because the poor guy, you 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 want to feel bad for him because we're hopefully a little bit decent people compared to maybe, you know, the people of the time. But I don't know. I, I, I guess I try to find what the, the novel was going for with, with the, the comedic part of this. And uh, it is just kind of silly all around, right. To think a guy, uh, even a, a grown man that is quote, five years old in his mind per se, let, let's say, uh, you know, is, is in love with a cow. That just seems, seems silly to me regardless well and then you see how the snopes without morality take advantage of whatever they can do to make money something from nothing right because it doesn't cost lump nothing to have a whole bunch of peep shows (laughs) around the barn as ike caresses this cow right this is a family show i'll let you use your own imagination there but he's charging money for this and the town's abhorred but they don't they don't do nothing about it they let it go on until Ratliff, the one that is, I think he's meant to be, the town knows what's right and wrong, right? Because because there's even that quote where he says, he knew, he knew not only what he was going to see, but that, like Bookwright, he did not want to see it. Yet, unlike Bookwright, he was going to look. <laughs> so the town knows it's wrong, but Ratliff is the only one that will stand up to the Snopes. The only one that stands up to those that are abusing the system to say, hey, we got to look out for each other. We can't just take advantage of Ike here. That's wrong. And you see, once again, the financial thing come into play where they decide to kind of, uh, was it Reverend Whitfield, who uh, you haven't read As I Lay Dying yet, but he's in that one, so I'm going to do that thing to you again, where there's a very (laughs) famous scene in that one, and oh man, he's a main character in that. But um, in in this one, he kind of recommends that they feed the cow to Ike to cure his problem. And again, you got, uh, was it Io convinced (laughs) him to spend the money on the cow? It just, whew, very very lamb to the slaughter by Roald Dahl, if you ask me. (laughs) Oh, when they were like, oh, we're just going to kill the cow and feed it to him and it'll get him over. You just you imagine poor Ike there eating be like, this is the most delicious steak I've ever had. And and, 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 the, and we're in the play and he looks over and there's his, you know, cow, his love, his best friend. And it's portrayed by a person and all the legs and arms are up and it's dead. He's like, <gasps> you know, what have I done? And mm. yeah, but like to get back to your point, I think Ratliff is a little bit of the moral compass for the town, maybe the story as a whole. Um I don't know, but I, I I think that it would be almost be wrong of us, like we said, to introduct, interject a lot of morality into what the Snopes are especially doing, but a lot of the townsfolk as well. Yeah, and 
you know, maybe when we say these, it's meant to be, nothing's absolute with Faulkner. Every character's gray. You know, it's, it's, it's shades of gray and you got to learn how to color those different shades when you're reading Faulkner. Um, mo- moving into like the last part of this was, I thought a little bit more interesting was the whole uh, Houston mink debate where because of that lawsuit, basically mink gets upset and kills Houston. Right. And, and we get this Houston backstory with uh, his wife where it's just like, oh, they just got married six months ago. And you're like, oh, OK, they didn't know each other that long. And then it goes into that backstory, the, the, the Faulkner backstory. Whenever Lucy, you know, Lucy's dead already, but you're going to get this backstory. You know she's an important character for uh, someone else, right? And, and they go through that backstory about how uh, she knew him since he was a little boy, and he was like the Lily Putin character. Again, another Gulliver's travel uh, myth laid over how he was you know, several years older from not like advancing in school, and she pushed him through it. That You see that there was a long, longer history there. And it's that history, like at first you're willing to dismiss, oh, they only knew each other for like six months. It's still sad, don't get me wrong. But when you know the, when they knew each other their whole lives and he ran from her and couldn't run any further and was always returning to her and always returning to town, uh, you realize there's more going on. And, it, and that's part of that Faulkner misdirection, if you will. And then it's just like, bam, 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 where all of a sudden you're going to fly through time where you're in the past, where he's got this... A horse. The horse mm-hmm. kills his wife by kicking her. <laughs> so he kills the horse. And all of a sudden we shoot to the present and Mink shoots uh, Houston off the horse. It's like death, death, death. Like it just stacks on top of each other so well. And you can just see it as one of those quick, brilliant flashbacks as like the most important part in this man's life and a defining moment. And and then all of a sudden he's dead, right? Like it's, it's just a very Faulkner way to have stacked time and themes together. And alongside that death, he takes and adds on passion, right? Because Houston and, and, and Lucy, they, they did love each other. And I love how Faulkner writes kind of their story and then gives you the context of the story. And you're like, oh, now I get it. And then with Lucy's accidental death, you know, I think that Faulkner is saying that, you know, passion can be lethal and that there's this, you know, combination of sometimes when you get what you want it isn't necessarily what you want and then there is this death that leads to that and uh, to your point it does seem to be like in rapid succession there of hey be careful what you wish for as the old saying goes yeah and you know there's there's a lot of hilarity to the scene here even with mink who tries to stuff his body in the stump of a tree and the dogs hounding him and he goes back and lumps just like well yeah you got that 50 bucks off his body right like like, you don't have any money. Why aren't you doing this? Like, you need to go get that money. I'll give you 25 bucks. Let me go get it. <laughs> like, there's, there's just more a lot swindling. of like, yeah. Yeah, more swindling. Everyone's trying to get a leg up on someone else. And then even when he's like in jail and his wife is starting to prostitute herself again, like you learn that she prostituted back in the day when he was in jail back in the day. And a small, another racial commentary here is how they try to blame it on the African-American guy, right? Even though Mink's the guy that had spent time in jail before, his wife... I don't mean, I don't mean to pass judgment, but she was a prostitute, right? And now she's prostituting again, probably at the boarding house. Yeah, everyone's willing to just blame the African-American right away, right? Like it shows a little bit more of like that power structure of the United States. Yeah, typical Southern stuff, but he does it in such a subtle way that Faulkner makes it so it's not blatantly obvious to the point of he's slapping you across the face with it. it it's it's there, but it's not there so often that you're like, all right, we get it. The South, you know, owned people. So that's one thing that's nice. He's Metallica entering his load phase. He's no longer the the black <laughs> album that, that everybody used to know and love. Um, but, you know, there's just like a lot of little surprises because there's quotes earlier in this novel where IO talks about how he's single. And then all of a sudden he's got a wife. He's got multiple wives. He's got kids now. Like there's all these reveals that Faulkner is constantly making us reevaluating what these characters are. Um, and then you even have like the, that it's kind of funny. The wall street panic kid <laughs> didn't have a name <laughs> up until he was 10 years old. Wall uh, street. Just, yeah. Yeah. Just, just great, great story writing from Faulkner. Very entertaining. Uh, but really it, it just continues up from there because, because next comes spotted horses in the peasant section. Right. Yeah, the, the, the climax, the, the, the ponies are back. You know, it, it always comes down to the ponies for Faulkner. And I love how he's able to incorporate them into the story. So tell us about the swindling of the ponies, Una. Yeah. And well, and I just love how he, he takes something from nothing, pulling himself up by the bootstraps when he ain't got no boots, right? 
And Flem's in the background letting Tex do all the deals. And then and then when they think Tex has the money, they said he gave it to Flem. But then Flem says he gave it back to Tex at the end. It's it's a great little story. And uh, we've got a whole, the, this next video in this playlist, make sure you're you know, following our playlist down below. We'll go into this whole deal in more detail, we'll say, right? But one thing that we didn't cover in that was, was the fence, right? What was the deal with Wall Street continuing to cross that fence? Right. If you remember, I kept telling him three different times, get on the other side of that fence. And these ponies we talked about being kind of like greed, selling something unbroken as if it were a broken horse for making profit, right? abusing your neighbors who know they can't train these horses. And you see greed jump over Wall Street. Right when he entered into that fence, what do you think that means? So you can answer. You can answer me honestly because I know what happens. But what do you think that means? I think that we get your comeuppance. I think that uh, Wall Street greed. Maybe it's too early for that, but I think there's been enough financial problems in our country at this point that Faulkner would be able to put those things together. That that's how I kind of took it. Okay. And we'll go into that here. Um, so again, playlist down below for spotted horses. And then in the town, we'll be able to finally reveal that. But then the last section, I think really, it shows it shows like we talked about how the ponies are kind of like bookends. Even outside of those bookends, we have the buried money in Vicksburg opening the story. And we're going to close with that buried money in Frenchman's Bend again, right? And you see, they see, they see the shadowy figure digging something at night and they, they know something's going on. So they go to check it out and they find some buried money, right? We, well, we should buy this land. So they try and trick Flem, right? But Flem's always got the two deals and he sells them the land for the price he intended. And uh, they dig night after night, not finding anything. And, and finally they look at the coins and they realize that those coins were pressed during a reconstruction, meaning Flem planted them there to make them think, <laughs> that there was buried money and then sell it for a profit. And then his family takes off. And to your point about Eula, does she know what she's doing? Well, they described her as looking porcelain, almost empty, like a ghost. Like I wonder if the, the Snopes are taking it out of her as they, as they leave town, having stolen a whole bunch of money from these locals. <laughs> well, it's that repetition of the different themes that we've seen again and again and again, not only in this novel, but in kind of all of his novels. And I, I, I love that. They're like, wait a minute, how could these bags still be here after, you know, all of these years? Again, back to kind of how we started this as whatever time period it is. There's no raw way that those cloth bags could be there 40 or 50 years later. And they look at the coins and they're like, oh, we've been duped. Mm -hmm. And uh, they really only have their self to blame for it because, again, they're being greedy and they're trying to take advantage of Lem when, you know, he's the ultimate grifter. He he had them over a barrel from the very beginning. Uh, and I, I love how uh, he ends off this piece and I'm excited to get into town. Yep. And we, we end with the Chickasaws who own the land and then the sawmills move in and they change the landscape the same way that the Snopes came in and changed everything. And so we start with a hamlet, right? And then we're going to move to the town, which is a bigger thing than a hamlet, only to end up in the mansion at the end. So again, let me remind everyone that I read this with the Faulkner and August group. I will leave links to all of their channels down below. And thank you. Special shout out to, to Brian to Roz, to Alan, to Greg, to all of our participants in that group. Uh, I will try to leave a channel to everyone's, uh, I will try to leave a link to everyone's channel down below and uh, click along on the playlist down below to find out more about Spotted Horses and head into the town. Una out. Peace. <laughs>